Hello. So our next topic is going to be on number theory. So number theory is, again, kind of mathematical. Uh, but what we want to do in this section is take some of the tools that we learned in logic and uh, apply them to some proofs. Uh, and now, when we go through this number theory, uh, it turns out that probably in math, you've done some sort of uh, proofs or some sort of um, uh, discussion about some of these concepts already. But what we want to do is use the concepts that we already know, like, for example, division and prime numbers, uh, something that we probably remember from math, and apply them using the logic tools that we now have. So things like direct proofs, indirect proofs, proof by contradictions, we want to be able to apply some of these uh, proof theories in something that we already know. And of course, we're going to go forward and we're going to learn a few more things uh, that probably we haven't seen before. So again, uh, number theory is really the assumption or is the study of mathematics where the assumption is that everything is an integer. Okay, so, uh, so unless in this section, unless I uh, physically tell you, unless I specifically tell you that the universe is anything other than integers, you can assume that the universe is always integers. Okay, so, so whether I say it's a number or whatever, uh, the, the universe is always an integer. All right, so let's begin. Uh, so I want to start off by defining this thing called division. Okay, now, uh, please make sure that every time we, uh, we talk about division, I am talking about this version of division. So this version of division is actually a true or false statement. So let's say A and B are integers, they are whole numbers, and the assumption is that A is not equal to zero. We say then that A divides B and it's, divi and it's denoted by A and then straight line B. So this is read as A divides B. If and only if, this is our definition, there is an integer C such that B is equal to A times C. Okay, so if we can find such a C, then that means we can say A divides B evenly. All right, so let's give a very quick example here. Uh, we'll call this 4-1, and uh, we can say that, for example, 3 divides 12, right? So 3 straight line 12 means 3 divides 12. Now, please understand that when I say divides in this uh, section, that we're really talking about the uh, a true or false statement. So here we are saying there exists an integer c so that 4, sorry, <laughs> 3 times c is equal to 12. Okay, now there is such a number because that number is four. So this is a true statement. It is true that three divides 12. Well, what about five divides 12? Can I say five divides 12? So is there an integer so that, uh, is, is there an integer C so that five times C is equal to 12? And the answer is no, there's no integer like that. So in, instead we say five does not divide 12. There does not exist an integer so that five times that integer is equal to 12, okay? So just remember, whenever you see the symbol A straight line B, another way to read that is A times an integer is equal to B. Just keep repeating that to yourself every time you see the symbol. So A times an integer is equal to B. Now, of course, there are other ways that we can express this as well. So, um, so that's the way that I, I'll keep using, uh, I'll keep uh, talking about it, but, um, another way to look at it is that b divided by a is an integer. Okay, so b divided by a is an integer. So for example, I can say 12 divided by 3 is an integer. Okay, so that is another way of saying 3 evenly divides 12. Now, in such a case, we call a the factor or the divisor of b. So 3 here would be the factor of 12. And B would be the multiple of A. So 12 would be a multiple of three. Now these terms, I think you've heard them in math before, but again, whenever you hear the word factor or divisor, usually it is a smaller magnitude than, the, uh, than B. So A is a smaller magnitude than B and B being the multiple is usually the bigger magnitude than A. So, so that's another way that we can uh, sort of remember this. Now, again, I want to stress that whenever I say 3 divides 12, okay, so 3 divides 12, this is going to result in a true or false 
value. Okay, so it's, it's really a true or false statement. So whereas in math, you always you, you also read this as three divides 12, but in math, you get the result 0 0.25. Right, so, so please make sure that you get that difference. So in this course, whenever we say A divides B, we are talking about the true or false version of it. Okay, so just make sure that you understand that definition. Okay, so division, once again, is the straight line. And when we have A divides B, it means A times an integer is equal to B. All right, so now that we have this definition, we can move on and we can start to uh, define some theorems that go along with it. So we have theorem one here that says, let A, B, and C be integers, so, so they're whole numbers. Then we have three statements, and these three statements are all true. So let's start with the first one. So I actually wanna prove the first one. I'm gonna leave the second and third one for you to prove, uh, but hopefully you'll get the idea after the first proof. So the first proof that I want to make is if A divides B and A divides C, so there's an and here. So if A divides B and A divides C, then A divides B plus C. Okay, so as an example, 3 divides 12, 3 also divides 9, right? So 3 divides 12 and 3 also divides 9. So therefore, 3 divides 21. So is this always true? Okay, I just gave you an example, but is it always true? So let's prove this. So what we're going to do here is we're going to use a direct proof. Now, again, if you recall what a direct proof is, is I'm going to assume the premise and show the conclusion. Okay, assume the premise and show the conclusion. So what's the premise here? We have A divides B and we have A divides C. So we actually have two premises here. So both of them are assumed to be true. And now let's see where we can go from here. The, ultimately, the conclusion that I want to make is this thing right here. So I want to be able to find out that A divides B plus C. Okay. So again, same uh, idea as our, as our proofs from before. We can say that if A divides B, we can say that there exists, I'm going to call it a K1. Okay, so there exists a K1 so that K A times K1 is equal to B. So there's an integer. Similarly, uh, we can say that there is a K2 so that A times K2 is equal to C. And that stems from uh, statement number one and statement number two, respectively. Okay, so now that we have those two, what can we say? Well, this follows, it follows that if we add the two sides of this equation together, we're going to get something like this. There exists a K1 and K2, so that AK1 plus AK2 is equal to B plus C. So I'm just adding both sides of the equal sign together, and I'm combining the there exists K1 and K2 together. Now, before you ask, is this possible? Can I just combine the two, uh, the, the two K1s and K2s together? The answer is yes, because we essentially have, the, they're, uh, they're uh, independent of each other. So K1 and K2 are independent of each other. So I can combine them into one statement, okay? So now what we have is that AK1 plus AK2 is equal to B plus C. Now I'm gonna factor the A out here. So we have A, times K1 plus K2 is equal to B plus C. Now this here is an integer. Okay, so A times an integer is equal to B plus C. So that means that we have A divides B plus C. Now again, I hope you recall that the definition of divides, the straight line is that well, when we have A divides B, then this, the A times an integer is equal to B, right? So you have A times an integer is B plus C. So therefore, what we can say is A divides B plus C. So there is our proof for the very first statement. So assuming that A divides B and A divides C, then A divides B plus C, okay? Now, can we use the same concept? Okay, so use the same definition and try to prove these two as well. Okay, so if you have trouble, please come to the office hour. Please send me an email and, uh, and let me know that you're having trouble with this and then, and then we can go over it as well.
but uh, basically what the what the second and third statements are saying is if a divides b, so if a times an integer is equal to b, then a times an integer is equal to b times anything. Okay, so a divides bc. So if a divides b, then a divides b times anything. Okay, that's true. So try to use uh, uh, mathematics in order to prove this. The third statement says if a divides b, so a times an integer is b, and b divides c, then a divides c. Again, can we use some mathematics in order to prove this? Okay, so I think these are actually pretty simple proofs. The idea, the, 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 the process that we're gonna take is actually very similar to what, we're, uh, what we did in this example. So try it out and let me know if you have any questions. All right, the other definition that I wanna uh, give you in this section is the definition of a prime number. So a prime number, a positive integer greater than one is called prime if the only positive factors of, uh, of p is one and p. So p in this case would be called a prime number. Any number that is greater than one that is not prime is called composite. Okay, so that means a composite number would be a number that's greater than one that has one as well as itself as uh, factors, as uh, divisors, but also there are other divisors as well. Okay, so as an example, uh, we can say, for example, 13 is a prime number. Okay, so 13 is prime. Okay, because the only factors are one and itself and one and 13. So another way to look at this is we have a divisor D that divides 13. Okay, so we want to ask what are the positive integers? What are the positive integers that D can fit into? Well, we can say d is, can be equal to 1 and can also be equal to 13. So 1 times an integer is 13. 13 times an integer is 13. So both of those are true, but nothing else. Right? There are no others that fit this definition. So by, by definition here, we can say 13 is a prime number. OK, what about something that's not prime? Well, for example, uh, 9 is not prime or it's composite. Okay, because again, if I say what divides nine, right? So what D divides nine? Well, the answer is one, nine, but also three, right? So three times an integer is also equal to nine. So in this case, because there is an extra three, we call this a composite number. Okay, so once again, just keep in mind that when we have uh, integers, when we have positive integers that are strictly greater than one, this is strictly greater than one, okay? When strictly greater than one, then, uh, then it's either prime or it's composite. It has to be one or the other. Uh, it cannot be both. Okay, and it must be one or the other. Okay, so kind of setting up for, the, uh, for uh, a theorem that we're gonna talk about eventually, we also have this fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Okay, so fundamental theorem of arithmetic, uh, as stated in your textbook, it says every positive integer, actually, I should probably add here, every positive integer greater than one. Okay, so, so we're still in that universe. Every positive integer uh, greater than one can be written uniquely as a product of primes where the prime factors can be written in order of increasing size. So really all this means is that every number that's greater than one, every positive number that's greater than one can be written uniquely as a product of prime numbers. So as an example, we can say the, the number 100 can be written as uh, two times two times five times five. Okay, so uh, you probably have seen this, uh, you know, in grade school, but usually how we would break, uh, break this down is we'd start with the number and we just think of two numbers that multiply to it. So for example, we can think of two and 50 that multiply to 100. So whenever it, you're at a prime number, you can circle it, okay? And then you keep breaking it down. So this is five times 10, so five is a prime number, and then 10, you break it down into two and five, and there you have it. There is the uh, product of prime numbers. Okay, so, so, uh, so oftentimes this is called a prime factorization as well. Okay, so another way to, uh, to say this is this is a prime factorization of 100. 
Now, the, the second thing I want to mention here is what about prime numbers? So how do we write prime factorizations for the number 13? Okay, the short answer is it's just 13, just itself. Okay, so it is possible uh, whenever you have a prime number that the uh, prime factorization is just itself because you can imagine that at the very beginning, you're already done, right? So you're already at 13 and that is already a prime number. Okay, so now we have the idea of prime numbers. We also have the idea of a fundamental theorem of arithm uh, arithmetic, which says every number has uniquely a product of prime numbers. So let's try to prove the next theorem here. So the, the next theorem, theorem two says, if n is a composite integer, okay, so if n is a composite integer, that means it's not prime, then n has a prime divisor less than or equal to root n. All right, so this might look like a pretty complicated theorem, but actually we have all the tools in order to solve it already. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do another direct proof here. Uh, but first, I want to kind of circle what we're dealing with here. So let's pretend that this part right here is our C. In fact, I'll call it C of n. So C of n is n is a composite integer. Okay. And then I'm going to uh, circle the rest of this. So I'm going to put a bracket around all of the other parts. So n has a prime divisor less than or equal to root n. I'm going to call this P. In fact, I'm going to call it P of n. So what we want to prove here is, in fact, we want to prove that C implies P. Well, which is good because we already know a technique in order to prove it. We're going to use a direct proof in order to prove this. So I'm going to start here. And if you remember direct proof, we're going to start with the premise. And then we're going to try to show the conclusion using logic, using inference, using math, using anything that we know. Okay, any type of argument that allows me to get from the premise to the conclusion, that's going to be the proof. So I'm going to start here by saying n is composite. Okay, this is our assumption. This is the assumption of the left-hand side to be true. Now, if n is composite, that means it's not prime. Okay, so what does it mean to be not prime? Well, clearly, it means that there is a factor other than 1 and itself. Okay, so... If it's not prime, there's going to be a factor, a positive factor that is between one and itself. Okay, so see if you see if you agree with this thick statement. So if n is composite, then it must be that n will equal a times b, where a and b are integers and a and b are between one and n. Okay, so a and b are integers and a and b must be between one and n. So if n is composite, then that must be true. Now, does a and b have to be unique? Like, do they have to be separate from each other? No, they can be the same number, but there must be two numbers that multiply to, to each other to make up n if this is a composite number. Okay, now what do we wanna show? We wanna show that n has a prime divisor, has a prime divisor less than or equal to root n. All right, so let's see if we can break it down this statement a little bit. Um, I'm going to write down the next statement. Now, this is a true statement, but I'm just going to write it down, and I'm going to show you why it's actually true. The next statement is that n, uh, sorry, either a is less than or equal to root n, or b is less than or equal to root n. This must be true. Okay, now, can, can you see why? We're going to take a little bit of a contradiction here. Okay, so remember proof by contradiction. This is kind of a mini proof by contradiction. So let's assume this statement is false. Can this statement ever be false? Okay, so we've already we already established that n is equal to a times b. Okay, so a is equal uh, n is equal to a times b. So what if this statement was false? It would mean that a is greater than root n and b is greater than root n. Right, that would that would be what uh, that would be what would happen. Now, what happens if we then multiply them together? We're going to multiply them. We get AB is greater than root n times root n, which is n. So you see how this contradicts what we just said was true. Okay, it contradicts what we just said was true. If this was a false statement, 
then we would get the fact that a times b is always greater than n, and this is not true. Okay, so I hope you can you can see what I'm what I'm going with there. Okay, but let me just write here. Otherwise, uh, a times b would be greater than root n times root n, which equals n. Okay, which is a contradiction. Okay, so this statement could not be false. So therefore, it must be true. Must be a true statement. And I hope you can see that that is a proof by contradiction. That is a mini proof by contradiction. Okay, so at this point, what have we established? Well, A and B are divisors, right? A and B are divisors. So we've established from what we argued in the first two lines here that there's a divisor, there must be a divisor. So there's a divisor, which is D, we'll call it D, which is less than or equal to root N. Okay, this D is either A or it's B, okay? Whichever one, okay? So it's, it's A or it's, or it's B. Um, so, so we have one divisor that's going to be uh, less than or equal to root n. All right, so at this point, it could be one of two situations because what we want to uh, prove is that n has a prime divisor less than or equal to root n. We want to find out that it's prime. So could d be prime? Yes, definitely d could be prime. So one option is that d is prime, or one situation, I guess, is that d is prime, in which case p of n is true. So we're done, right? So if d happens to be a prime number, then p of n is true. Okay, but what if it's not? So the second case is that d could be composite. But what happens if d is composite? Well, d has a prime factorization. Okay, so d is composite and d has a prime factorization because of what we talked about in the previous theorem, right? Everything that is between one and, well, anything that's greater than one actually has a prime factorization. So we know d in particular has a prime factorization. So either way, so either one or two, d, uh, we'll just say this, n has a prime divisor, which is less than or equal to root n. Okay, so it could be d itself if it's prime, or it could be one of the uh, one of the the prime numbers in the d's prime factorization. But either way, n has a prime divisor that's less than or equal to root n. Okay, so. I hope you can you can get the proof. You might have to go back and, and take a look at this uh, this part again a few times if if this proof a lot went a little bit quickly. Uh, but what we've ultimately proved here is that the following statement must be true for all n. C of n implies p of n. This must be a true statement. Now we're going to say that the universe here is n greater than one. Right? So for all the numbers n that's greater than one, if n has a composite, sorry, if n is a composite integer, then n has a prime divisor less than or equal to root n. This is always true. It's true because we just proved it. Okay, there's a corollary that comes from this. So uh, the word corollary means that uh, it's a statement that comes directly from a theorem. So the corollary says the number 101 must be prime. Okay, now how is it that I can take this theorem and figure out that the number 101 is prime? So I'm going to show you. So again, uh, from what we had before, we know that for all n, c of n implies p of n. Okay, so c again is this part right here. So n is a composite integer and the rest of it is p. So we have n, sorry, c of n implies p of n. Now, in particular, we can instantiate a value. So we can say C of 101 implies P of 101. Now, take one second just to, uh, just to convince yourself that this is a true statement, okay? So from the fact that we know this, from the fact that we know for all N, C of N implies P of N, can we then say 
that C of 101 implies P of 101? Well, of course, because N is uh, 101 is part of N, right? It's in the universe of N. So surely I can plug in one of those values and that must be a true statement. Okay, so again, make sure that you, you're convinced that C implies P is actually a true statement here. So I know this is true. Now, what I want to show is that the number 101 is prime, or another way to say that is that it is not composite. So I hope you agree that this is the conclusion. So the number 101 is not composite, so it must be prime. Okay, now, if this is the conclusion we want to make, what are we missing? So we have C implies P. I want to conclude not C. So what are we missing here? We're missing one line here in order to show that not C must be true. And the answer is not P. Now, I'm going to put a question mark here because as of right now, I don't know whether this is a true statement or not. But if I'm able to show that this is a true statement, then surely not C of 101 must be true. Okay, so let me, let me repeat that one more time. Now, from what we proved in theorem two, we know that C of 101 implies P of 101. Okay, we know this. We wanna conclude that not C of 101. We want to uh, conclude that 101 is prime. So what we need is we need to show that not P is true because from modus tollens, right? From modus tollens, we can then conclude that C of 101 is true. All right, so what is this statement? Let me just do it in a different color here. So what is this statement? This statement, not P of 101 says N, doesn't have, or n would be 101, so let me fill that in, 101 doesn't have a prime divisor, which is less than or equal to root 101. Okay, 101 doesn't have that prime divisor. Okay, so what is root 101? It's about 10, it's roughly, uh, roughly equal to 10. So what are the prime numbers what are the positive prime numbers that are uh, less than or equal to, to 10, right? Roughly 10. Well, we have two, we have three, we have five, we have seven. And that's about it. Now, again, I, I want you to realize that one is not a prime number. Okay, so I, I need you to keep that in mind. So the prime numbers start with two. So the prime numbers are two, three, five, and seven. Those are the ones that are strictly less than 10. So are any of those divisors of 101? And the answer is no, it's not. So therefore, I know that P, uh, not P of 101 is a true statement. Okay, so I can say none are divisors of 101. So none of these are divisors of 101. So therefore, we have that not P of 101 is a true statement. Okay, 101 doesn't have a prime divisor less than or equal to root 101. Okay, so this is how we can use this theorem too, which is actually a very popular theorem uh, in order to figure out whether or not a number is prime. So if it is a, a, a prime number, then that means that we can take roots of that number and then I can find all the prime divisors that are less than that and see if any of those are divisors of this number. Okay, so if it isn't, then I for sure I can conclude that this is a prime number. All right, so what about 201? Okay, so if I wanna figure out is the number 201 prime, well, I'm gonna go through the same process. What is the root of 201? Mm, it's about 15, somewhere around there. So what are all the prime numbers that are less than or equal to 15? We have two, three, five, seven, 11, 13, something, something like that. But we'll find that three divides 201, right? So the number three divides 201. So is it composite or is it prime? Well, it's composite because right away we know that three divides this number. Okay, so again, what this theorem is telling me is how we can determine whether a number is prime or it's composite.
right? We find the root and then we find all the prime divisors that are less than that possible prime divisors and one by one we analyze, okay? All right, so I hope this makes sense. Um, I wanna talk about one last thing here and then we'll, we'll uh, move on to the next video. So there is a uh, division algorithm. All right, so a division algorithm is again, probably something you've dealt with in math, but you probably haven't called it as such. So let A be an integer and D be a positive integer. Okay, so D is a positive integer. Then there are unique integers Q and R with R between zero and D and strictly less than D such that A times DQ plus uh, A is equal to D, uh, DQ plus R. Okay, so let me just show you where this is coming from. In fact, I'm gonna uh, prove this theorem a little bit later in the, uh, in the course, but we have A is equal to D times Q plus R. So what this is saying is, Given A and D, so if I if I just give you the number A and I give you the number D, so let's say I give you the number A one hundred and one, and D is one uh, is eleven. Okay, there are going to be unique Q and Rs that fit this equation. And what are Q and Rs? They're integers, right? They're integers, and R has to be between zero and D. Now, you, once I explain this, you'll probably know where I'm going with this, but again, let me just give you the answer here. The Q in this case is nine, and the R in this case is two, right? So we have 11 times nine plus two is equal to 101. So what is Q? Well, Q is called the quotient. Q is called quotient. And what is R? R is the remainder. So what I basically t showed you here is that when I take 101, divided by one, uh, sorry, divided by 11. So I take 101 divided by 11, I get the quotient nine, I get the answer nine with the remainder two. So really this is just a fancy way to describe long division. So I have 101 divided by 111, and then this is equal to nine, this is equal to 99, and I subtract and I get the remainder two, right? So these are the different parts of this equation, but we, we should probably come back to this word unique. So for any two numbers, any two numbers that I give you, uh, the Q and the R are going to be unique. They're gonna be unique to those numbers. So there are no other Q and Rs that would fit this equation. Now you might be wondering about that. Well, it's because the remainders are always constrained in this way. Okay, this, the, the remainders are always from zero up to D minus one. So another way to say this in this example is that when I divide by 11, okay, so any number divide by 11, the remainders will be between zero and 10. I cannot get any other remainder other than that. Okay, so if you're finding that you're getting a remainder that's outside of that range, it's the wrong remainder. Okay, so the, uh, uh, we typically make this mistake when uh, A is negative. So let's do an example of A being negative. So A, let's say is negative 11, and then D is equal to three. So here we are dividing negative 11 by three. Okay, and what is the quotient here? Well, the, the Q, it can be a negative number. So in this case, it's negative four. Now, being a negative number, we're gonna multiply it so it goes uh, further, it goes, I guess, more negative than the left-hand side. And then we're going to add one to this. Okay, so we get a negative 12 plus one is equal to negative 11. So once again, the way to check whether or not you have the right answers in this case is you check whether the remainder is between zero and D minus one. So in this case, if we're dividing by three, if we're dividing uh, any number by three, the only remainders that I'm allowed to have are zero, one, and two. Okay, so just keep that in mind. So this is called the division algorithm. Any two numbers, when I divide them, is going to give me a unique Q and R, where R is constrained between zero and D minus one. Okay, all right. So I know we're kind of in the middle of number theory here, uh, but what we'll do is uh, I'm going to conclude this video. And in the next video, we're going to do a little bit uh, a bigger of an application from the, uh, from the definitions that we have. So I'll see you in a bit.